and I'm going to record it there. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you all here. Wonderful to have you at, for this third class in part two of our Genesis Deep Dive Bible Study. Um, this is uh, today's October 20th, 2021. Welcome to everybody who is with us on Zoom. And welcome to everybody who is uh, watching this later on after the fact on YouTube. We're glad to have you joining us as well. Um, if you're joining us by online, uh, actually all of you should have received an email with all the handouts for today. Um, what you've got is, you've got a, a handout that has sort of an outline of today's time and place to take, keep, take notes. There's a, a, a handout called Using Bible Study Help. And there's a handout called Laws of Composition. Uh, if, if, if you got those through your email, they're not in pretty colors, but, uh, but they are all the same thing. If you're joining us by YouTube after the fact and you'd like any of these handouts uh, or the manuscript for our study, you can send an email to church at newbeginningscma.org. It's church at newbeginningscma.org, and we will. Uh, send you all that you need in order to follow along with this course. Um, this is New Beginnings Christian and Missionary Alliance Church in Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm Pastor Danish House, and we're gathered here on multi purpose room for this deep dive Genesis Bible study. We're going to pray, and then we're going to dig into our topic, and then dig into the passage for tonight as well. Let's let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this evening, this, your love for us this evening, and that you love us so much that you speak to us. Um, in the passages we've been studying with Abram, uh, you, your love has been expressed by, by your reaching out to him, uh, to both to save him in the middle of crisis and to speak to him, to start a relationship with him. And uh, Lord, you do the same to us. You, you reach out to us. And tonight, you're reaching out to us through your word. And I pray that you give us open hearts, ready to hear and, and receive what you have to say to us. Uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit so we can see wonderful things in your word. Uh, and bless our study, bless each, each participant, and uh, may we just have a great time uh, in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, so tonight, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, before we dig into the manuscript study, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about studying the Bible on your own. Uh, when you're at home, this, this method of Bible study, this manuscript method of Bible study, is not really difficult to do even when you're at home. Uh, it's, it's something that you can prepare for yourself. Uh, you go to, uh, I, I go to a, a Bible program, and I copy the text that I want to do, I paste it into a Microsoft Word document, double space it, print it off, and I'm good to go. But there's, but when you're studying on your own at home, um, you don't have the advantage of studying it with other people, right? That we get the advantage of each other's eyes and each other's hearts and, and the Holy Spirit working in each other's lives. So, uh, but there are tools that you have at your disposal. And I want to just talk through some things that you can do uh, to assist your Bible study as you go along. Remember that, um, that the method of, this method of Bible study encourages you to look first and then to listen or interpret, and then finally to live out what you're learning. It's important, even when you're on your own, to slow things down and to not jump ahead to interpretation until you've done the hard work of looking and observing in the text. Um, the, the tools I want to give you today are tools to enable you to help you in your observation. It'll help us here in class and it'll help you when you're doing it at home on your own. We talked a bit about some of this stuff, but this handout, the bright green handout, Laws of Composition, um, is a help to you in terms of what you're looking for when you're observing. We've talked about repetition, for example, as a, as a key component of how authors get their point across. They repeat the same terms, usually in the same word, or, or perhaps synonym. Uh, if, if they're using synonyms, then it might be called continuity rather than repetition, but either way, 
it's repeating the same idea over and over again so that you get the point of what they're trying to say. So you're looking for repetition, you're looking for continuity, you're looking for contrasts. Are there opposites in this passage? Uh, do you see, and I think in our passage today, you'll see some very clear opposites that take place. Um, so the example that's given on your sheet is in Psalm 1, it contrasts the wicked man and the blessed man, right? That's a very clear contrast. But even in our passage today, you'll see a very clear contrast between uh, multiple characters. Uh, comparison. Uh, this thing is like that thing, right? Um, maybe you might see it in parables, right? The kingdom of God is like a man who goes out and sows seed in the field, right? Um, or you, and sometimes it will explicitly use the word like, and sometimes it won't. But in any event, it is making a comparison between things that we know so that we can better understand. Uh, maybe you might look at general to particular movement, uh, starting from kind of a, a general idea and then giving you specifics about how that works out. Uh, Psalm 23 starts off, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then Psalm 23 goes on to say, well, how is it that the Lord shepherds? Well, he leads me beside still waters, he leads me in green pastures, he restores my soul, right? All those different things. Particular to general, going from particulars, you know, the other way around, right? It's not, not starting from a general idea and then giving you examples, but starting from but having a bunch of examples and then drawing a general conclusion. Um, cause to effect, right? We've seen that a bunch of times in, uh, in, in Genesis so far. And God said, and there was, right? Or God said to Abram, go. And so Abram went, it's cause to effect. But you might see effect to cause at some points. You'll, you'll, it'll, it'll say something like Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Sometimes it'll use words like because or for uh, to, to help uh, signal that. You might see explanation, a presentation of an idea or event followed by its explanation. Jesus will tell a parable and then he'll uh, be asked a question by his disciples and he'll go and explain it more. You might see a preparation or an introduction, uh, sort of a, a, a section or a verse or a paragraph that sort of sets the stage for what's to come. Um, you might see a building to a climax. Um, you might see a means to an end. Hi there, Janet. Good to see you. Uh, you might, or you might see a question that's posed and then an answer. Question and answer kind of thing posed as interrogation. These are different ways that authors use to get their point across. And if you're familiar with these, it'll help you as you're looking through your manuscript to see more than you might otherwise see. What's fun about these is that these are, doesn't matter what language you're reading it in, if it's in Hebrew or if it's in Greek or if it's in English, these same principles apply. People who write in Hebrew use these same things just like writers in English do. The second handout that I have for you is about using Bible study helps. And this is where I want you to be very careful, but I want you to, to, to feel free to use helps, just to use them in a particular way. Um, and I have, I face this when I get ready to preach every Sunday. Um, I try, when I preach, when I'm preparing my sermon, I try to start with a, a session of observation and kind of just look, 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 look and see what the text says and not bias my mind uh, by what other people think it should be. And I'll try to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying and try to look and see what's actually there. Um, but there are helps that can help you to observe more but oftentimes those helps will edge into interpretation. And so what I have to do as I'm studying is I have to try to get the help I need to observe without reading the stuff that's, that, that brings me to interpretation. I do that because I think that discipline helps me be a better student of scripture. And I, I don't want to sort of skip ahead to the next step until I'm ready. So uh, with that, I would encourage you to, to do the same thing. 
that when you're doing your own Bible study, that you would take the time to observe. And whenever you feel like whatever, if, if you're using a help, or if you find that that help is, is edging into interpretation, just back off. So I'll, I'll read that part later. Last week, I, I introduced this book in the New Bible Dictionary. A Bible dictionary is a great help for observation. Usually, it doesn't cross the line into interpretation. A Bible dictionary will just give you facts about the word that you're looking up. If you find a word in the scriptures that, especially if it refers to uh, a, a place or a person or a thing, um, those are, if you're in a good Bible dictionary, you'll have good articles on those things. Uh, you can find articles on different customs that take place in the Bible. Uh, one of the things that's true about the scriptures is that it's, it's like visiting a foreign country, right? Uh, it's, it's in some cases, you know, 4,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, they did things very differently. And, and getting some help in understanding those things can be really handy. This is the one that I use in the New Bible Dictionary, but there's plenty of, of good Bible dictionaries out there. Um, and uh, in this day and age, as people are moving towards computers, you can find Bible dictionaries online, or you can buy Bible dictionaries at used bookstores for like a nickel. Because <laughs> people are moving online, so they're available. Um, you might also be helped by just having a plain old English dictionary. There are sometimes words that the translators use in English that we don't necessarily use every day. Uh, also recommended is a Bible handbook. Uh, there are some, there's a, a lot of great handbooks that help you to um, understand uh, customs or geography in the Bible. Uh, you might find, uh, they're, so they're often called just Bible handbooks or handbook to the Bible. Uh, those are really handy books to have around. Uh, really, really helpful is a concordance. A concordance, is, if you've got a study Bible, at the back of your study Bible, there is a concordance. But you can find exhaustive concordances that give you every occurrence of every word in the Bible in that translation that you're using. So if, if you see a word like altar, right? So Abram builds altars. If you want to see every occurrence of the word altar in Genesis, you can open up your concordance, look up altar, and, and find every reference to altars in Genesis. And that makes for a fascinating study to see where else those words are used. Um, I do it on the computer because it's way easier, um, but you can buy printed concordances as well. Uh, we talked last week about the value of atlases or maps. Again, I do this on the computer, but, um, but if you're a, a, a physical book person, having a, 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 a good Bible atlas can be really handy. Uh, the next help is, is commentaries, and, and this is, I think, where we cross the line into interpretation. Um, there are some commentaries, when you read a commentary on a Bible book, that will uh, have a section on observation and then a section on interpretation. That's really handy, because then you can make sure you sort of keep that separate. But if, if the commentary you're looking at doesn't do something like that, I would hold off on the commentary until you're finished with your observation. And I'd hold, on, I'd hold off on using a commentary until you've done your interpretation. You observe and you interpret, see what does it say, what does it mean? Uh, and then you check it up in the commentary and say, am I out to lunch? You know, is, is what I'm seeing there really there? Do other people see this? Or am I just making something up out of whole cloth? Uh, commentaries can be really, really helpful, but I would encourage you to use them after you interpret. Bible translations or paraphrases. It can be really helpful uh, to have multiple Bible translations open in front of you when you study. Um, and just read it in one translation, read it in another translation, read it in a third translation. What that'll do is it'll give you a very good idea of what the confusing words are in the passage. What are the words that were uh, the translators had a difficult time picking uh, the right English word to represent the Hebrew or Greek word that's behind it? Where you see them differ substantially in their interpret in their translation, you know that there's a concept there that's tough to render in English. 
Do you have any suggestions for a good comparative Bible? Yeah, so it, I, I think uh, the, the Bible translations that I strongly recommend, I, I recommend any Bible translation that you like. But there are comparative Bibles out there that like give all four. Yeah, yeah, so the, so, you, can, so you, I, I don't know any particular ones that I recommend. Uh, I certainly have owned them in the past. When we had the fire here two years ago, um, a number of them were destroyed. Um, I haven't repurchased them because it's just as easy for me to pull out four Bibles or to pull out four translations on my computer screen. Um, but uh, and this this might be controversial, and I apologize if, if this upsets you. But um, there is one Bible translation I don't recommend, but I recommend against. Um, it's called the Passion Translation. A lot of people like it, um, but I've been doing a lot of work in it, and uh, it's uh, I recommend against it. I, I I recommend the English Standard Version or the NIV or the Revised Standard Version. I recommend the King James Version, the New King James Version, the Holman Christian Standard Version is excellent. Uh, the New Living Translation is excellent, but the Passion Translation I don't recommend. And again, I'm going on all in here. Maybe I may have offended somebody, but um, I hope not. But the Passion Translation, what I found as I've studied it is that number one, it's it's not really a translation. That's a that's a misnomer. Uh, it's a paraphrase. Uh, the, the the it was translated translated by one person uh, only in his own study, and and he came to it with an agenda. His agenda was to add passion to the, the text. And so he puts in more stuff to kind of make it more exciting and more emotional. Um, and uh, in, the, in the process, he actually, I think, mistranslates a whole lot of different things. He also makes a, a few very questionable decisions uh, at the beginning of his work that influences everything that he does. I don't want to go into too much detail. I'm happy to do that in conversation. It's not helpful for me to run down that trail here. Yeah, um, the word of God. yeah so I, one of the one of the key things that you'll see if you if you take the Passion Translation and any other translation, you'll find that the Passion Translation is like 50% longer than every other translation. Because there's more words, and not just more words, but more ideas. Um, and that's that's dangerous, I believe. And it's more dangerous because he says that's not what he's doing, and it is what he's doing. Uh, when you read the introductory notes to it, he says, ah, this is a word-for-word -word translation that is malarkey. It is not a word-for-word -word translation. Um, so because either he's trying to mislead us on it, or he just doesn't realize it, either way, uh, it's a bad idea. So I don't recommend the Passion Translation. I do recommend virtually any other Bible translation. And comparing translations is a help to help you figure out what are the tough words or tough sections to translate, and that will help you sort of see where some of the controversies might lie. Any questions about that? I, I, I just dumped a nuclear bomb, so <laughs> I apologize. Uh, uh, next would be Bible study guides. Um, I don't recommend these. For use in the beginning parts of your study, but getting a, a, a Bible study guide, like a, a, a yeah, there's study guides for all the books of the Bible. You can find different companies, different authors that lead you through with, with, with helpful questions. They're great. It's, that's just not where I would start. Um, there's also some really good books on how to study the Bible. Um, the one I really recommend is on this list: How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Fee and Stewart is the best book on this topic. I, I, don't, I don't think you can do better. There's plenty of other books, but How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. They, they also wrote a book called Reading the Bible Book by Book, which uh, doesn't edge into interpretation, but gives you a good background on every book of the Bible, which I think is really helpful. So that's Reading the Bible Book by Book. Or how to read the Bible for all it's worth. I, I love how this handout ends. It says the best Bible study helps are the Holy Spirit, your mind, 
pen and paper and other Christians. <laughs> uh, that's absolutely true. And I think that we can uh, and have a great Bible study just with, with other believers, prayer and pen and pencil. So, these, are, these handouts uh, come from my past as a staff worker with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. So we use these in a course called Bible in Life. And so that's why they have odd page numbers at the bottom and they're, they look old because they are old. Uh, I was giving these handouts to college students uh, 30 years ago and I'm giving them to you today. Any questions on these helps for observation? Anybody online, any questions? Well, let's dig into our manuscript then for tonight. Uh, at our last study time, again, if you're joining us by Zoom, or by, uh, I'm sorry, if you're joining us by YouTube later on, maybe you don't have a copy of the manuscript, you can just send an email to our church, church at newbeginningcma.org, and we will send you a copy of this manuscript. It's the manuscript in Genesis. Um, we're on page 20. We're starting off the manuscript on page 20. And we finished last time at line 12. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And, and our, our passage starts with the words, and Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds. So that's where we're starting our manuscript. The question is, where do we stop? That's our first question. So uh, again, there's not a right answer, although I think in this case, it's a lot clearer than in the last one. I, I, I felt like this one, there's not going to be as many differences of opinion this week as there were last week. But take a look at this and, and let me know, where did you draw the end of this, this next passage? Esther? Yes. Um, I went to page 21, line 10, and the first word, Lord. And that's Lord. where I thought the cu cutoff should be. Page 21, line 10, after the word Lord, before in the days of Amraphel. Yeah, okay, good. Excellent. That's what I did. Nicole says she did that too? Yeah. Chris, Karen, Dave, uh, I did that as well. Um, why? So why? Why would that be a good place to stop? Change the subject. Yeah. It seems like we're, we're moving into a different story. And if you were to keep going, where would the next story end? It's a long ways away, right? Uh, you'd be going to page, then to page 22, probably, right? So it would make for a, like a two and a half page passage. That's not impossible, but it is a lot to digest in one Bible study. So yeah, that's a good place to stop. Did anybody have someplace different? Those cats can shake their head no. Jim says no. All right, great. So let's let's do that. We're going to end on page 21, line 10, after the word Lord. So as always, we're starting with, with three, a three-step process, right? We're going to look, we're going to listen, and we're going to live it out. Right? So let's start with, look, what are the things that we observed in this section of scripture? What did you see that interested you? Who wants to be first? Karen. Abram and Lot had, they both had too many things to, uh, and possessions and herds to uh, stay in the same place together. They had to separate. They had too many possessions to stay in the same place together and they had to separate. Um, I want to point out uh, contrasting words here, right? You have the contrasting pair of together and separate. Right? Those are contrasting words. <laughs> They could not be together, so they had to separate. And you see them uh, repeated here, right? In line 11, line, line 13, 
could not support both of them dwelling together. And then line 14, they could not dwell together. And then you see in line uh, 18, separate yourself from me. And then line 24, thus they separated from each other. And then line, in page 21, line three, the, after Lot had separated from him. So repetition of together versus separate. What a good problem to have in some sense, right? I mean, they, they went down into Egypt in the previous passage because in some senses they didn't have what they needed. They, there was a famine in the land and they had to go down to Egypt, but now they're coming out of Egypt with more stuff than they know what to do with. What else did you observe? Very good, Karen. Thank you. No. That for them to separate, they had an issue. What? So what word was used to describe the issue? Strife. Strife. There was strife. Was there strife between Abram and Lot? The herdsmen. Strife between their herds. Yeah, that's pretty cute. Okay. What else? Good, good observation. Thanks. What else did you see? I mean, it's the same thing connected to the strife that Abraham didn't want to be at odds with Lot because of that. So, so what so was it? That was key because he says because we're kinsmen. Because we're kinsmen. Yeah. That's what's important to Abraham, right? The important thing to Abraham is we are kinsmen. Uh, we shouldn't be at odds with one another. We're related to each other. To which I say to Abram, have you ever been related to anybody? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm being cynical, but a lot of families have strife, right? But actually, that's helpful for us to know, right? A lot of families do have strife. And so, you know, maybe if our family has strife, we can take a look at this passage and, and see something out of it. Yeah, so there's, there's strife between them, but Abram says, look, we're kinsmen, we shouldn't have strife. What else? Abram built another altar. Is that Kevin? Yeah. So where do you see that? Uh, last line of our what we're studying tonight. So page 21, line 10, or line, line 9, right? We, we have Abram build another altar. Okay? So that's key. Altar. Um, Let's let's take a second just to look around that, right? Uh, look around that bit. Um, he, where does he build the altar? Line nine. Yeah, line where, where she exactly. Oh, where are you mean uh, location? Gotcha. <laughs> the Oaks of Mamre in Hebron. The Oaks of Mamre at Hebron, right? Yeah. So uh, we we've seen the Oaks of Mamre before, right? At Hebron. Um, We'd seen the Oaks of Mamre at, no, we saw the Oak of Mora, yeah, right? In, in uh, 1910, we saw the Oak of Mora. So now we have the Oaks of Mamre. Okay, these are, these are different. Um, the Oak of, of um, Mora, Mora means, back in, in two pages ago, Mora means the Oak of Teaching. So it was clearly, uh, or we believe, it was a, a tree where um, there was pagan prophecy that was taking place. But Mamre is a person, and we'll meet Mamre later. So the Oaks of Mamre is, is not here talking about paganism, but it is talking about uh, a particular individual whom Abram will have dealings with later on. So that's at Hebron, um, and he builds an altar to the Lord. Excellent. Altar building is very important, right? So we, we've seen altar building be very important in our passage so far. Uh, we, we, we noticed that Abram was building altar after altar after altar, and then he runs away to Egypt, and while he's in Egypt during the famine, he doesn't build an altar. And it's not until he leaves Egypt that he builds another one. And now he's resuming his habit of building altars in the places where he goes. What else did you see? That when when they separated. When, go ahead, Beth. 
when they separated, um, Abram let Lot choose where he wanted to go first. You would think the elderly Abraham would maybe choose and tell his younger nephew that that's where, but that's not the way it was. Abram lets Lot choose, and, and Bev makes a very good point here. That's kind of countercultural. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dave, did you have someone go arrest Bev? She just stole my phone. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's, but it's a great one. It's a good point. I'm glad, we, I'm glad you both have it uh, because Abram does something that he doesn't have to do. Abram could say to Lot, hey, you're the young one. You go that way, and I'll go this way, right? Uh, when, he, when, they, when he gives Lot the choice, um, and I want to just sort of camp out there a little bit and say, Abram has received a promise from God about land, right? What's, what promise has Abram already received from God about land? Do you remember? Yeah, that he would uh, lift up, that he would give his offspring a certain portion of land. Yep. And what I found was like in line four of page 21 to uh, uh, it was like a precursor to the Abraham covenant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we're, 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 we're getting towards a covenant that God's going to make with Abraham that specifically lays out the boundaries of the land that he's going to give him. Up till now, the only description Abram has is it's the land of Canaan. That's it. He's been told he's being given the land of Canaan. It's not been defined. But here Abram is in the land of Canaan, and he gives Lot a choice to take a part of what God has given him. Uh, you could look at that two ways. Like one way is like I just say, here's Abram. He's not respecting the gift that God's given him. He's giving some of it away already before he's even gotten possession of it. Another way to look at it is that he's inviting Lot to be part of the promise of God, right? Uh, I think both are, are, are interesting observations. I lean towards the second one, but I think Abram is giving Lot here an opportunity to take part, be part of God's blessing. He's, he's his kinsman. He wants Lot to be blessed. Um, but yeah, so he gives Lot the choice. Um, how does Lot choose? Sure, you want to talk. What is it that what is it that Lot? What makes Lot's decision for him? He picked the best spot he could see. He picked the best spot he could find. Right now, okay. So, what? I mean, in a culture where respect for the elders is like one of the most important principles there is, what should Lot have done? Should have given to Abraham. Give, give, give the best to Abraham, right? Abram's his uncle, right? Uh, Abram's the one he's supposed to honor. He should have given the best part to Abram, but instead he picks the best part for himself, the part that looks the best. Now, that's a very important observation that you made there, Sherman, because what Sherman said is what looked the best. Is there any indication that the land that Lot chose is not the best? Yeah. Yeah. Because Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, yeah. So, so we get red alert words here, right? Uh, there's there's actually three place names that are used, uh, four place names that are used about where about where Lot goes. Okay, three of them are red alert words, right? Uh, Sodom is one of them. Gomorrah is another one. What are the what are the two other place names that are used for the area that Lot chooses? Oh, that's true. So, so how do we think about that? Zora and the Jordan Valley. Oh, oh. That's that's not good. Really Zora and the Jordan Valley. Now, what other place names are used? He looks and he sees what it's like. Well, Walter, like the yeah. Garden of the Lord. It's like the Garden of Eden, right? Like the Garden of Eden. Like the land of Egypt. Egypt. Like Egypt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's our here's our red alert 
words, right? Sara. Right? Gamora. And Egypt. Right? These are names that theologically, for the people reading this, would have been just like, whoa, what are you thinking? Right? Why would you go to a place that's like Sodom and Gomorrah? Why would you go to a place that's like Egypt? Egypt's the people who enslave us, right? Uh, for the first readers of this passage, these are words that indicate that Lot is making a bad choice. It goes further than that, though. It, it, it even, there's even explicit commentary on the people of Sodom. What does it say? They were wicked. They were great sinners against the Lord, right? So it's like, there's no subtlety at all here, right? But what what, the, what the, the narrator is telling us is Lot is making a really tragic choice. He's setting us up for bad things happen, happening down the line, right? He says, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Uh, this is bad. It looks good, but then there's even one more. I, if you go to page 20, line 21, right? This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, the Lord's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Good to know, right? Uh, well, heads up here. These are not cities that have a long lifespan ahead of them. Um, this is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The men of Sodom were wicked and great sinners against the Lord. They're living in a place that's like Egypt. Oh, oh, Lot, don't go there, right? It's a, it's a bad thing. Yeah. But could it have been, it was an either or either, either Abraham and there are lots of brothers in the direction. Well, that's a good question. So if, if Lot hadn't gone there, would Abraham have gone there? Um, if you look at your map, let's go back to our map, okay? We gave out a map last week, and again, if you're on, uh, if you're on YouTube watching this, you can get the map from church at the beginning cma.org, it will send one to you. Um, but, uh, and, and this is, it's kind of time here, but uh, we don't know really where Sodom and Gomorrah were. They're not there anymore. They haven't found it, okay? But we do know where Abram is right now. Okay, Abram is in Hebron. Uh, it's about uh, midway, it's about halfway down the Jordan River. You can see uh, the word Galilee up top of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea at the bottom of the Jordan River. And about halfway down is Hebron. And there's a really high point there at Hebron where you can look out and you can see forever. You can see forever. And um, so you can see all down the Dead Sea from that point in Hebron. And our best understanding is that where Lot chose to go is just south of the Dead Sea and to the east. In other words, on the other side of the Jordan River, um, on the other side of the Dead Sea, he chose to go outside the promised land. Okay. How do we know this? Well, why do we believe this? Well, it says on uh, page 20, line 24, and going into page 21, Lot goes east, right? And Abram settles in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in one of the cities of the valley. Um, meaning that somehow Lot is not in the land of Canaan, okay? Lot has left the promised land. God had promised the land of Canaan, to Abram, and Lot is not living in the land of Canaan even after he had the choice. Sue, go ahead. Going back to page 21, 15, the sentence that says, at that time the Canaanites and the Bessarites uh, were living well in the land. Why did they say that? Okay. okay. That's a great observation. No, so, yeah. Okay. Page 20, line 15, we have another one of those little comments that seems to stick out like a sore thumb. It says, and at that time, uh, where at that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. We noticed 
uh, last time on page 19, line 10, it had a similar thing. It said, at that time, the Canaanites were in a lake. Um, so here we have, I would consider this a repetition, right? We've now had the same odd sentence now said twice. What's going on? Why, why what is, I'm not going to, come on, it's an interpretation of the passage, but what role does this serve here? When it says, at that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were in the land, what purpose is there for saying that? That they might not get along? With the Canaanites and the Perizzites? No, uh, Abram's, Abram's family and so yeah, so so they might be considered to be uh, interlopers in the Canaanites' land. So maybe there's the possibility for some friction between Abram and the Canaanites. Uh, maybe Abram doesn't want friction with Lot and with the Canaanites at the same time, right? That might be part of it. Yeah, I mean you're definitely going to have to figure it out. But it's like to. Maybe they're setting it up for all the different people that the Israelites are going to have to fight. Yeah, but it's it's in the wrong place. <laughs> it, it does seem to, it does seem to be <laughs> oddly placed. It does <laughs> seem to be oddly placed. We know in history that the Israelites are ultimately going to fight the Canaanites, um, and at the time when Exodus when Genesis is written, they haven't yet. They haven't fought the Canaanites yet, but they know they're going to. Um, so that's definitely part of it. Uh, another part of it might be, let's not fight in front of the children. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, it's like, we're going to be a bad witness to the Canaanites if we're fighting uh, and they're there to see it. Um, that's a possibility. I, I don't really know. They might consider that as weakness. Maybe. Maybe they would invite them to attack. Yeah. Or it could be telling us that even though God sins, Abraham to a new land that the land was not uninhabited even though he was born. They were sent into an undiscovered place. So that's going to be a, a point that gets made a bunch later on is that when Abraham is sent into the land, it wasn't uninhabited. It wasn't empty. There were people there that had to be actually either dispossessed or incorporated into Israel, one or the other. Um, so let's, let's, I said, Back on page 19, let's put a pin in, uh, there, were, there were Canaanites in the land. Let's put a pin in this one as well. Let's see as we go along if these sentences will make more sense down the line, because they don't make a lot of sense now. I, I noticed that, um, that that one line was put in between the two mentions of strife, strife between the herdsmen, and then let not strife come between us. Yeah. So it's kind of sandwiched right in between those two lines. So the strife, it's, it's, it, the Canaanites are, are in between strife and strife. So one would think, and I think you're right to point this out, Kevin, that it's got to have something to do with the strife between Abram and Lot. Uh, something about the strife between Abram and Lot is a, is a bad idea when there's Canaanites around. For what reason? I, I don't think we know yet, but it, it's... Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not good for us to have strife when the Canaanites are there. Good observation. And that's right out of the text, right? There's, a, there's that textual sandwich, sandwiching this sand, between strife and strife and the Canaanites in between. What else did you see? The Lord started talking to Abraham. So at the end of the story, uh, once they separate, we have visit number three between the Lord and Abram. Okay, as we've talked about um, uh, these are visits, or, or we're using the terminology of a visit between the Lord and Abram. Um, and the Lord visits Abram after Lot had separated from him. Um, so if Abram has put God's promise at risk, by giving Lot the choice, it doesn't seem like God sees it that way, right? God comes to Abram, he doesn't rebuke Abram. In fact, he reiterates Abram's promise and actually expands on it a little bit. I wanna, I wanna ask you this. Uh, let's 
Let's look at what the Lord says to Abram. What's the first thing the Lord says to Abram in this visit? Look, lift up your eyes and look from where you are. Have we heard that anywhere before in our passage? Page 20, line 20, Lot lifted up his eyes. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so page 20, line 20, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley. Now God says to Abram, lift up your eyes. Okay, so Abram gave Lot the choice and Lot lifted up his eyes. And this is one of the things I like about the English Standard Version is it's pretty literal. It translates the Hebrew fairly literally. And uh, if, if, if all it said was, hey, take a look, uh, we might not have caught this, but lift up your eyes is a very odd phrase in English. And because it's translated literally from the Hebrew, we see it here pretty clearly. That uh, Abram gives Lot the choice, says lift up your eyes. And then when the Lord comes to talk to Abram, he says, "Look up, lift up your eyes. How did, when Lot looks around, Lot lifts up his eyes and looks around, where does Lot look? Look to the Jordan Valley, right? In the direction of Zor. Um, when God tells Abram to look up, lift up his eyes, where does he tell him to look? In every direction. In every direction, right? Look north, look south, look east, look west. Look all around, Abram. Uh, if you think that Lot has taken a bite out of the territory that I've given you, think again, right? You're still getting all of it, right? It's all going to be yours. Look now, look north, look south, look east, look west. It's all going to be yours. Is it? Is it Abram's? Is he giving it to Abram? And your offspring. And your offspring, right? I give it to you and your offspring forever. This Sunday, uh, in in our church service, uh, a man named Jordan, which is kind of fun, right? <laughs> Jordan preached about how God is an eternal God, that God lives forever, and that part of that is that God can make forever promises. That God can say things like, I give this to your offspring forever, because God will be there to make sure it happens, right? So yeah, I will give you and your offspring this land forever. He makes further promises about Abram's offspring, pretty elaborate, pretty amazing promises. I'll make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, then your offspring can be counted. So we've got now a very elaborate offspring promise. It's not just the sort of vague, you're going to be a great nation. Now he's saying, you're not just going to be a great in influence, you're going to be great in number as well. It's going to be a lot of offspring for you, brother. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, what else does he promise Abram this time? Did he give it to him? He said, I think he said in Abram that his offspring is going to be so much of Canada and he got it. Yep. It's like almost saying it's numberless. It, it's a so huge number. It's a huge number. dust off the earth. Right, yeah. It's a huge number of offspring. He's going to give the land to Abram and his offspring. He also gives Abram a command, right? Walk through the length. Walk through the land. Get up, walk through the length of the breadth of the land. I'm going to give it to you. And then you have one of those great cause and effects, right? So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the Oaks of Mount Rochelle. He put Abram in there, built an altar to the Lord. So Abram, God gives Abram a command, he says, get up and walk. And so Abram does, uh, I think it's four verbs. Abram moved his tent, came, settled, and built, right? When, when Abram went, and when Abram arose, he, he moved his tent, came, settled, and built. Abram is obeying God, and he's, and he's sort of unpacking God's command here and doing the things that God wants. Notice, we've, we've said earlier that the covenant of God involves being 
God's people in God's place under God's rule, right? God's people in God's place under God's rule. Notice that once the Lord starts talking, he says all of this, right? The Lord says, uh, I've given the land to you and to your offspring. Your offspring is going to be great. And then Abram builds an altar to the Lord. Right? This, this, this relationship with God is reaffirmed at the end. And Abram actually reaffirms it. So we've got these three components here in this last chunk. We have place, we have people, and we have relationship all in this little package here. So the, the covenant of God is, is firing on all cylinders uh, here. Anything else? Other observations? Here's a fun little observation I thought that I had never seen before until I studied it this week. Uh, page 20, line 24. Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Okay, we have a direction that Lot goes in, right? Lot journeys east. Um, actually, if you look on a map, Lot journeys southeast, okay? But the author tells us that Lot journeys east. Is there any significance to journeying east in our in the book of Genesis? Can you think of any other times in the book of Genesis when someone starts somewhere and journeys east? It's specifically said to have journeyed east. They don't use the word journey, but they, they head out. There's I can think of two instances in the book of Genesis so far where someone starts somewhere and goes east. When they were driven out of the garden. Okay, that's number one, right? From the Garden of Eden, they journey east. They leave the Garden of Eden journeying east. That's number one. There's one more. Mm, good, good guess. Good guess. You're getting warm, Sue. It's Cain. Cain. Right. So, page seven, line 22. The first one was page six, line seven, Garden of Eden. And page seven, line 22, uh, Cain. Cain kills his brother and is driven away from the presence of the Lord. And he goes east. There seems to be a theme, okay? When people are leaving the presence of the Lord, they go east. Okay? The, garden, the Lord was living with them in the Garden of Eden. He drives them out of the Garden of Eden. They go east. When Cain is driven from the presence of the Lord, he goes east. And here, Lot intentionally chooses to go east. Now, I'm not saying... What I'm saying is that this seems to be a very subtle theme that the author is using to tell us, again, east that east is the wrong way for Lot to go, right? That going east is some way, somehow for Lot, it's choosing to walk away from the Lord rather than to walk towards it. Now, we know theologically, right, the Lord is everywhere. If, if, if you left this building and you went east to go home, you don't have to feel guilty about it, okay? <laughs> it's not a theological point for all time. But in the book so far, every time someone takes a journey east, it's a journey away from God, not a journey toward God. And that's just a, a, a subtle thing the author is doing to let us know that Lot was making a bad choice. 
So ultimately, yeah. So, so, so the author of Genesis is not the author of Matthew, but yeah, but when you get to when you get to the New Testament, the wise men came from the east. Uh, oh, from they, the east. They, and they were west. No, they came from the they came from the east to the west. Oh, so they were west. So okay. I guess that yeah. does work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> So maybe this thing goes farther than I thought. I don't know. Uh, but but I, I think it's interesting that if you look at places in Genesis so far, we go east, they're always going away from the Lord. And again, not that we needed another reason to doubt Lot's choice. I think it's just another little subtle thing. Maybe I'm making that up. Maybe it's a weird thing. But that's, that's what I saw when I was looking at it this week. Uh, what else did you see? Anything else that, that interested you? Anybody online? Something that we haven't mentioned that you'd like to mention before we move to interpretation? I'm just thinking, even though light shows the wrong direction, he could not have had any idea. That he was going into the lines and so to speak. He had no idea that these people were so clean and fell against God. So that's a, a, a good question to ask is does Lot know? Does Lot know he's going to a wicked place? And we don't have to answer that. It's uh, I, here's what I will say is that later on, when the Bible evaluates Lot, what the Bible says is that Lot was a righteous man. Okay. Yes. Uh, when the New Testament looks back at Lot, Lot, the Bible says the New Testament says Lot was a righteous man. What I will tell you is that that's very difficult for me to to fully grasp <laughs> because as we look at the story of Lot, Lot seems to be a mixture. Let's put it that way: at best, a mixture of righteous and unrighteous, uh, or at least righteous and foolish. Um, so. But, but when, when the New Testament looks back at Lot, the New Testament says, Lot was a righteous man who was vexed by the wickedness he saw. <laughs> That's what it says in the New Testament. So obviously we trust the New Testament's interpretation of this passage. But what I will say is that it's sometimes hard to, hard to get that out of Genesis. Um, but that might just be our culture. In our culture, it's hard to see that. Um, it, might be, it might have been easier to see that from uh, a Jewish point of view. Especially since he ultimately obeyed God in the end to, to flee from. We'll, we'll look at that. May, may that may, we may modify that idea. I don't know. Yeah. The uh, lots, Pastor, lots of some, something else that I noticed. Um, Abraham was told to look in all directions, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. But he was also told to walk the length and the breadth of the land. Yes. So he's told to walk everywhere where he's looked. He's got a lot of walking to do. Yeah. And we'll later on we'll get a, a, a good sense of what the borders were that Abram walked. Um, there seems to be a, a, a custom. If we, if we looked at some Bible dictionaries here, what we would find is that there seems to be a custom which says which gives a right of ownership to someone who walks around a parcel of land. It seems to be a custom that was followed. If you walk around a parcel of land, then that's your way of sort of staking ownership. And if Abram walks around the entire nation, that's a, that's a very big, it's a good walk, right? Uh, but uh, in any event, what the Lord is certainly saying is that uh, I'm gonna give you the land that you walk around. Uh, I want you to walk throughout the whole land. And I'll give it to you. Let's let's uh, move away from now from looking. So we we spent a good time, good amount of time here in looking. We've seen a lot. I'm gonna we gotta listen. So we gotta ask the interpretation question. And we'll we'll give more instruction in future weeks about some advice about interpretation. But the key thing about interpretation is to ask, okay, what does this mean? We've seen all this stuff. What does it mean? What is the, what's the point that the author's trying to communicate through these facts? The author's trying to tell us 
something or many things? What are the things that the author is trying to tell us? Um, and again, I, I'll, I'll give you this handy three chart uh, test that I use. What it, or structure? What is this passage teaching us about God? What is this passage teaching us about people? And what is this passage teaching us about faith or religion, a relationship with God? Um, there's other questions you could ask. It doesn't have to fit into one of those three categories, but I often find that those questions help me interpret a passage. Um, as you look at all the facts that we've gathered, what do you think the author is trying to tell us? Sue? So, I think we know. No, 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 no. That promises. Okay. So Lot has to read. He's got to get out of the story because he's not Abram's offspring. Oh. And Abram's offspring are going to be the ones who get the promised land. They're the ones who are going to multiply, be counted, and all that stuff. And he's not on that. So he's got to get out of the story. Okay. That's good. That's, that's it's hard to get better than that. Uh, that's really well put, Sue. Uh, those of you who are online, you may not have heard it clearly, but the idea here is that we've been focused so far in, in this story on the promises of God. Right? God's promises. And, for example, in the prior passage, God had given Abram a promise of offspring and land and God's relationship, and Abram put it all at risk by going down to Egypt, out of the land, uh, got his wife married to Pharaoh, right, which puts offspring at risk, uh, and uh, he stops building altars while he's down there, so he sort of puts an end to the relationship with God. So all three of those things was at, were at risk. There was a crisis that God stepped in and solved. God solved the crisis by getting Sarai out of the house of Pharaoh and getting them back into the promised land uh, and, and getting Abram back into a place where he was willing to build an altar. Well, in this passage, we see another crisis for the promise, right? And the, the crisis is kind of a subtle one, but as Sue points out, Lot is not going to be Abram's heir. Lot is not Abram's offspring. And right now, if Abram dies, uh, everything he owns goes to Lot. So you have to get rid of Lot out of the story. And so from a storytelling point of view, Lot has to go. And from God's promises, Lot has to go. So this crisis <laughs> needs, to leave, needs to end up with Lot leaving. There has to be. You could kill him, yeah. <laughs> Depending on who the filmmaker is, maybe it's Zack Snyder that killed him with a you know, nuclear explosion or something. But uh, yeah, so you, you got to get Lot out of here because Lot is a hindrance to God's promises. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's not going, or at least he's not going to not going to facilitate God's promises. So, so that we have a crisis surrounding God's promises. Okay, and but let me ask you this: Let's just take a little interpretive step here. We said at the beginning. When we were doing our first observation, we said that there was a problem with being together, that they needed to separate, and that there was strife. The crisis is about this, that they're together, but they need to separate their strife. Who solves this crisis? Abram. Abram. I just want to camp out here for just a second, okay? In the previous crisis, God solves the crisis. In this crisis, Abram solves the crisis. Okay? And Abram solves the crisis by being generous. Right? I just think this is fascinating. Abram solves this crisis by, in some senses, behaving as God would be. Abram is in a relationship with a God who is generously giving Abram land, giving him offspring, a promise of offspring, and having a relationship with him. Abram solves the, this crisis by giving Lot land. 
right? Abram is, in some sense, is becoming more godlike. He's doing the things that God would do. So God's promises are at risk, and Abram solves it by asking WWGD. Right? <laughs> Although GD is not a good one. <laughs> what would God do? What would Yahweh do? WWYD, right? What would Yahweh do? Um, he asks, how would God solve this, this situation? I'm putting words in Abram's mouth. But he does the thing that God would do. He's generous to Lot. So we have a crisis of promises, and Abram solves it by being generous. I think that's just a wonderful little thing. Uh, is that the author's point? Is that what the author's trying to tell us? I think I'm going to leave it open, but I think it is. I think it's one of, one of the things the author's trying to tell us. What else? As you look at this passage, as you look at what we've seen in this passage, what other themes do you see coming out of this passage? Pastor? Yes. Um, over where uh, Lot settles for uh, Sodom. Yes. It also puts in mind of Adam and Eve with the apple. And it's like not everything that looks good is good. So I'm, uh, if you're a little muffled coming through, and what I'm hearing you say is that there may be a similarity between how Lot looks and sees that the land is good and Eve looked and saw that the fruit was good. Is that what you're saying? Yes, when really it wasn't good. Exactly, okay. Yeah, so Lot looks and sees that the land is good, but he's wrong. And Eve looked and saw that the fruit was good. And she was wrong. It was pleasing to the eyes. It looked good, but it turned out not to be. So let's let's draw an interpretation out of this. Let's let if we're interpreting this passage, we might say something like, uh, "What looks good ain't always good." Oh, that's, that's even more, even more sync. Appearances are deceiving, right? Yeah. Oh, and even with Pharaoh and uh, Abram's wife, same thing. But she looked good. She, she was married. She did look good. <laughs> she was married. <laughs> but she was married, right? That's true. Yeah. So yeah, appearances can be deceiving, right? What looks good ain't always good. Who is it who determines whether it's good or not? God. God, right? What seems good to us isn't always good, but God is the, is the determiner of whether it's good or not. So we have Abraham solving the crisis by being generous like God is. We, we see that sometimes we are mistaken about what's good and what's not good. What else do we see? What other, what other interpretations can you draw on this passage? When I noticed, and then I just noticed it, like when all the strife and the separation was going on, God didn't speak, God didn't say anything. It was like quiet until he spoke to Abraham. So why do you think God didn't step in on this crisis? He didn't need to. He didn't need to. But he didn't have to make it like easy. He could have. So God could have stepped in and possible. solved this one, but he doesn't. He leaves it to Abram. Um, I think that this tells us a little bit about the character of God, right? Uh, God wants us to mature into people who solve our problems like he would solve them, right? Uh, God has a plan for us to mature, to become not independent of him, but to become more like him. And, and we have to exercise what we've learned in order to actually mature in that way. So sometimes God doesn't step in because God wants us to use what we've learned from him to solve our problems, right? It's not that God says, hey, you're on your own now, okay? Because God does show up at the end, right? 
And he says, good job, Abram, you've done good, right? Uh, but God's goal for us is not that he programs a little robot with the instructions and that robot then does it. God's goal for us is to mature into, into uh, beings who, who voluntarily do the things that God himself would do. Am I stretching that? I don't think so. I think this is a, the first real, one of the first hints of this, that, that God's goal here is not just slaves, but God's goal here is, is, is partners, right? It's junior partners, but partners. Yeah. Very good. Someone else, one more. Let's come up with one more. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, God... Um, leaves this problem to Abram to solve as he would solve One more, somebody else. I don't know, Pastor, when I look at it, it um, we kind of spoke around it, but um, so Abram gives Lot the choice. Lot takes what's pleasing or the good land, but God is reassuring to Abram that he's with his promise and says, after um, Lot goes that way, he says, look around you. I still have you. Nothing's changed. So he's reassuring in that way. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we have God reassures Abram he still got it. I'll say he still got this. That's a good colloquial phrase right now. God's got this, right? God reassures Abram that he's still got this. It, it's you've not you've not destroyed my plan. It's all still good. Um, yeah, excellent. So God has reassurance to Abraham. Why well, don't we need that reassurance, right, from time to time? Uh, when we go through tough situations, we're making tough choices, and we don't know if it's going to really work out. It's really nice from time to time to have God say, hey, I got this. You're good. Don't worry about it, right? Uh, God comes in and reassures us. Um, that's a great, a great interpretation. Let's just take a minute now and we'll move to living this out, right? Our goal is not just to fill our brains. Our goal is to move our hearts and to move our wills, to, to become more like Christ, to hear the words of this passage and put them into practice in our lives. So this is going to be different for each one of us. What God has to say to you may be very different from what God is to say to me in this path, from this passage. So I want you to take just a minute now, prayerfully, and ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What are you saying to me tonight? Why did you want me to hear this passage and study this passage tonight? Take just a minute and, and listen to the Lord and jot down what you feel the Lord is saying.
when you're when you're applying a passage, I have a little four four part acronym that I like to use to uh, sort of help me focus my thoughts about applying. Maybe there is a truth that God wants me to accept. Right? God wants me to accept a truth. Maybe there is a doctrine that God wants me to believe after being in this passage. Maybe there's a sin that God wants me to confess. Or maybe there's some concrete action that he wants me to do. I use that A, B, C, D to help me interpret. Is there, is there a truth that he wants me to accept? Is there a doctrine he wants me to believe? Is there a sin he wants me to confess? Or is there an action he wants me to do? Um, maybe those words will be helpful for you as you work out applying the passage of scripture that as you're studying. Does anyone want to share what God said to you out of this passage? Again, you don't have to, and it's not, not a requirement, but if, if, if there's something God's been saying to you and you'd like to share it, I'd like to give you the opportunity to give testimony. Pastor? Yes, Janet. The area of the strife, I've always tried to be like a people pleaser. Mm. So I don't want strife, but that part where he says to leave, I have to learn to um, go away from the negative and those causing, you know, strife. You not always think it's, it's me. You need God's wisdom to help you resolve strife. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. crazy. Somebody else? Well, I think you're saying that if you listen to me and really trust in me and have faith that God will look after you and take care of you. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> It says, uh, if you if you listen to what God says and follow what he says, it will take care of you. That's awesome. Somebody else, what did God say to you particularly tonight? Sometimes in our family, I'm not going to be included in God's same plan for us. Oh, boy. That's a toughie. <laughs> what Nicole said is that sometimes our families will not be included in God's plan for our lives. That's a hard, that's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly have uh, family members who I love very much who are not following God's plan for their lives. And as far as I, as best as I can tell, right? I'm not, I'm a, I'm a flawed human being. I don't have perfect judgment. But as I look at uh, some of my family members, I think, oh my gosh, you are not, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, but I, you know, it is something we need to accept at times is that our, not all of our family will, will walk in God's way. Yeah. That's a toughie. Anybody else? I was thinking of make decisions with mercy. Making decisions using mercy. Yeah. That generosity of spirit that Abram shows, which has to be a result of his encounters with God, right? We need to let the mercy and generosity of God uh, show through in our actions as well. Yeah, praise God. Let's take a minute and pray. Lord God, thanks for this evening. Thank you for meeting us in this passage. Thank you for the cool things that we've seen. Thank you that this passage, even though it it relates to events that happened 4,500 years ago. It's still very fresh and very relevant to our lives today. That uh, you're still speaking, that people are still people, and that, uh, that the things that we see and hear and learn in this passage are still important for us today. God, I pray that you would help us as we leave this place, as we log off of this class or leave this room, that we would 
put into practice the things that we've heard and, and, and live differently because of what we've seen in your word. And thank you, Lord, that uh, that change is a, a change that your Holy Spirit makes in our lives. And that we're not just doing it on our own strength, but we're trusting in you to, to lead us and guide us. Lord, please bless everyone within the sound of my voice. May they um, know your presence in their lives and may they follow you well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So your homework for next time is start at page 21, line 10. And uh, I think what you'll find is that it, that's, this story encompasses virtually all of the next page. You might go a little further, you might not. Um, but uh, I, I would recommend not. <laughs> <laughs> what you'll find when you go into page 23 is that that's a long story too. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna go that far. But uh, yeah, I, I'll just say, I, I think it, go, it encompasses all of my, all of page 22, up to line 24 on, on page 22. And uh, so study this, this next story. <laughs> this is an interesting story because we get more about Sodom and Gomorrah here. And it's not necessarily what we expect to find about Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, if you're familiar with the stories about Sodom and Gomorrah, this might not be what you expect. Um, and it's, but it's very interesting. It teaches us some things about Abram's relationship with God uh, that are very, very key. So I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a great passage. It's got all sorts of names that you can't pronounce. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to ask anybody to read it out loud. Uh, thanks, everybody online. Thanks, everybody here in person for the Bible study today. Thank you. Thank you. online people on the stock recording.